Okay, so in this lecture, uh, we're going to briefly review some facts about bilinear forms on fields. And um, yeah, so this is going to be so um, in this section. We'll review uh, basic properties of bilinear forms on a vector space. So the basically the the important the reason why this is important for number theory. So it turns out that this trace that the trace. So the notion of trace from the last couple of lectures. This, this actually gives rise to a really important bilinear form. So it gives rise to a bilinear form of the same name. And studying this bilinear form, it turns out, is going to be useful in showing that uh, of the same name. And studying this bilinear form is more or less how we prove that rings of integers are finitely generated Z modules. Studying this bilinear form. Leads to the fact that uh, Rings of integers are finitely generated C modules. Okay. So this is um, why we're gonna be talking about bilinear forms. Okay. So first I should tell you what a, a bilinear form is. I guess let me give you the overview of what the lecture is gonna look like. Okay, so first, um, I'm just going to tell you what the definition is. Okay, then we're going to talk about um, gram matrices and discriminants. So these are ways of essentially, well, the gram matrix is a way of describing the bilinear form in a matrix. And the discriminant is a way to tell if your uh, bilinear form is what's called non-degenerate. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, I guess the third thing is kind of like um, non-degenerate bilinear forms. And the dual basis. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with um, definition. So what, what is a bilinear form? So this is 19.1 uh, definition. Okay, so uh, let K be field. And let's say V is a um, let's just say k vector space okay and what is a bilinear form a 
bilinear form so a bilinear form on on V is a map I guess is a, a bilinear map so uh, what do I mean by this uh, bilinear map psi from V cross V I guess maybe it's, it's poor forms to use the, the word you're trying to define in the definition so I'll avoid that so it's, it's going to be a map from V cross V to the field K such that um, basically it's linear in each factor so for all C and K I guess maybe I should say let's say for all C1, C2, and K and let's say uh, V1, V2, U1, U2 in V we have so it's linear in the first factor so psi of let's say C1, V1 plus U1 um, and then I'll just put V2 there, it doesn't really matter what I put in the second slot um, it's going to be linear in the first factor so it'll be C1 psi of V1 um, V2 plus psi of U1 V2 okay. so this is linearity in the first factor okay and then it needs to also be linear in the second factor okay. so this is going to be v1 let's say c2 v2 plus u2 Gonna be psi. It'll be sorry. It'll be c two psi of v one v two plus psi of v one u two. Okay, and this is linearity in the second factor. Okay, so. It, it's essentially a way of, of pairing um, vectors. So the the kind of like first example you would see in math is the dot product is a bilinear form. Okay. So um, the prototypical example is the dot product. Um, this is a map. Uh, yeah, I guess, okay, I'm not going to re redefine what the dot product is. Hopefully, by now you know what the dot product is. You can define it on Rn. You can define it on really any vector space, um, any finite dimensional vector space at least. Um, and uh, yeah, so the prototypical example is the dot product. Everything else is kind of generalizations of this. Um, not every property of the dot product. Um, every bilinear form does not have every property that the dot product has. So, um, continue this definition. A bilinear form is called symmetric. Okay. If so, for all u and v and v, it doesn't matter which order I compute their pairing. Okay. So I can swap the entries in in psi, um, and this this doesn't happen for every bilinear form, but when it does, they're called symmetric.
Okay, and the dot product is is a symmetric bilinear form. Okay. So these are the um, this is what a bilinear form is. The dot product is the prototypical example. There are other um, bilinear forms. Okay. So um, I want to move on to the second thing, which is gram matrices and discriminants. Okay. So definition. So what is what is the gram matrix of a of a bilinear form? Um, so let's say let psi be a bilinear form. on a vector space V. Let's say V is finite dimensional, okay? Uh, on a vector space V, finite dimensional over K. And further, let's say that we have a basis. Um, actually, okay, we don't, let's not presuppose these. So first of all, let's define what the gram matrix is. So if, let's say, E1 through EN is a basis, is a basis for V, then the gram matrix gram matrix of psi with respect to this basis is, okay, so what is, how do I define the gram matrix? I think I picked the wrong pen here. is the matrix which looks like so essentially you just take all the possible pairs of basis vectors and you form and you compute what side those guys are and that gives you a an m by n matrix So this is this gram matrix. It turns out it tells you a lot about your bilinear form. Okay, um, the determinant of this matrix is called uh, the discriminant. Should be should have numbered this nineteen point two. Okay, so um, it turns out so the the gram matrix is kind of all you really need to know about a bilinear form. Um, so here's the nineteen point three. Important remark. Uh, bilinear form. is determined by its gram matrix in the following sense. Uh, there should be no apostrophe there. Its gram matrix in any basis. Okay, so what do I mean by this? If, let's say, u and v are vectors in v, and let's say I, I, I know what they look like in the basis. So u is ai ei, and v is vi ei. OK, 
Okay. Well then. Then um, if let's say A is the gram matrix. of psi with respect to our basis of EIs, then I can compute the value of psi by doing some matrix multiplication. Okay. And psi of UV if you use bilinearity in both factors, you'll find that this is the sum of the AI BJ psi of EI EJ. Okay. And this is the sum over I and J plus an equal to N. Okay. And it turns out that if you um, compute a little matrix multiplication, this is going to be the same as the vector of A's. So view it as a row vector, so take the transpose if you like, times the gram matrix times the vector of B's. Okay, so essentially knowing the gram matrix makes it possible to um, compute this, this guy's size. So like, it's not possible that two two different bilinear forms have the same gram matrix. So that's what I mean when I say determined by its gram matrix. Okay. Um, and so what, what do we care about this discriminant concept? So it turns out there's something called um, non-degeneracy. Um, so definition, I guess there's a couple ways you can do this. I'm just gonna define it as follows. Uh, definition. A form, let's say psi is non degenerate okay. it's non degenerate. If so, this is the, the definition part. Let's say if um, the discriminant is non zero, is non zero with respect to some basis. Okay. Um, it turns out that um, I guess there are a couple like different things you could ask here. So like, you know, w one concern is so warning or like concern. Uh, concern. Um, the discriminant can be different for different bases. Can be different for different bases. Okay. So this this can certainly happen. However, it turns out that um, essentially changing the basis allow, uh, amounts to multiplying this guy by two invertible matrices. So if this has non-zero determinant, then with respect to one basis, well, multiplying by invertible matrices isn't going to change that. Um, and we'll talk more about this in um, more lectures about the discriminant, like what happens when I change basis. Um, but for now, you, you should know that this is a well-defined condition. The above is well-defined. Okay, um, so the next thing I want to talk about is like, okay, what is this? What is this non-degeneracy condition really saying? What is it? What am I saying when I say that the gram matrix is um, invertible? 
Okay. So, proposition the following are equivalent. One, psi is non-degenerate. So again, psi is a non psi is a bilinear form on, let's say, a finite dimensional vector space. non-degenerate to um, there's something called the left kernel so the left kernel so what is the left kernel defined as um, the left kernel of psi is, is the set of v and v such that psi of v times x equals zero for all x and b. Okay, so one way to think about this kernel, this left kernel is saying that um, basically this bilinear form can't tell the difference between v and the zero vector. So the, the condition I'm putting on, so psi is non-degenerate is equivalent to the left kernel of psi, which is this set. Um, being trivial, i.e., just the zero vector. Okay. So, um, if my form is non degenerate, then this left kernel, then basically. By sticking vectors in the in the left, this form can always tell the difference between it and zero by testing it on some vector in the right. Okay, and then the the other condition is the symmetric condition, the right kernel. So you can imagine what the right kernel is. Sorry. Oh yeah. yeah. No no no. Yeah, the right kernel is trivial. So non-degeneracy is really a condition about um, like how, how one way to think about it is non-degeneracy is a condition on how often um, the pairing of two vectors is zero. Okay, and I'm not going to fully prove this, um, but I'll, I'll give you a hint basically. Um, the fact that these are equivalent follows from remark 19.3 And the fact that a matrix is invertible if and only if um, it has uh, like trivial, well, I guess if you're using like the first things you learn in linear algebra, trivial null space, trivial kernel. Okay. Um, yeah, essentially, this condition of being in the left kernel uh, 
Well, the condition of being in the right kernel basically says that um, you're in the kernel of A, and the condition of being in the left kernel is something like you're in the like kernel of A transpose, um, something like this. Okay. And the, the final thing is somehow um, it's super important for the proof we're going to do. Um, and it's a little, little confusing concept. So uh, the final thing is basically a remark about, about dual bases. If psi is non-degenerate, psi is non-degenerate by linear form, then, then essentially psi can be used to, to understand the, the dual space of V. Um, let's say a finite dimensional vector space V. And we've got this map. V maps to the map which sends x. So this is kind of a confusing thing where you have this iteration. Okay. This is a map from V to its dual space. So this map here, x maps to psi of V comma x is a linear map on V gives an isomorphism from V to V dual. Okay, so psi is non-degenerate. Okay, so this is where this non-degeneracy condition comes in. Then there's an isomorphism from V to V dual described by psi. Um, if you've seen something like, uh, well, if you've, if you've taken like a, an advanced linear algebra class, you've probably seen something like this before. Um, and if you've taken any like functional analysis, this is somehow an analog or like, you should think of the like Reese representation theorem from functional analysis as some big generalization of this fact. Um, but yeah, that's beside the point. Um, how do I know this gives an isomorphism? Well, I know they have the same dimension, so it suffices to check this is injective. Have the same dimension. So it suffices to check in injectivity. Okay, and I realize that the dual space may not be something that everyone watching these lectures is super comfortable with. Um, remember, this is the space of uh, this is the space of linear functions on V from lam from V to K lambda linear functional. So I guess really I can drop the word functional. It just needs to be linear. Um, okay. And a common, uh, like a standard fact from an advanced linear algebra course is that these two things have the same dimension. Um, so I just need to check this map is injective. Um, however, this is exactly the condition that the left kernel is trivial. Um, this is exactly. condition that the left kernel is trivial. OK. 
Okay, so basically, if v is in the the left kernel is exactly the kernel of this map v maps to this um, linear functional. Okay, so I guess you could tack on um, like a fourth thing, which is that this map here. V maps to x maps to psi of v comma x um, is an isomorphism of vector spaces. Yeah, I guess you should also check, like you know, that this is actually a linear map and so on. Um, okay. So, what's the importance of this fact? So, so why is this useful? Well, essentially, it's useful for the following. Okay, this tells me that okay, if I have a basis okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna call this isomorphism let's say um, big psi. Okay. Say if I have a basis ei, okay, then. Uh, standard fact from linear algebra, then I can construct a dual basis. So this is how you actually prove this fact I referenced earlier that these spaces have the same dimension. A basis Fi with uh, Fi of Ej this is, uh, it's zero if i and j don't match, and it's one otherwise. Okay, so the, it's essentially the indicator function on uh, whether the basis vector I plugged in is, um, matches, whether the index of the basis vector I plug in matches the index of my linear functional. Okay, so this is, Somehow, I mean, this is essentially one way to think about this is these f sub i's just pick out like the ith coordinate. Um, if you're thinking of v as like k to the n, um, this just picks out the ith coordinate of your vector. Okay, and that's a, a linear functional. And this is the dual basis for the ei or ej. Um, and I can use this isomorphism psi to essentially translate that back into a basis for big V. Um, so I'd let E sub I prime, this is gonna be big psi inverse of E sub, or sorry, big psi inverse of F sub I. And then what useful properties does this have? So I guess the collection of e sub i prime has the, the following useful properties, I guess. First of all, it's a basis. So this is a basis since f i is a basis and psi is a big isomorphism. Big psi is an isomorphism, sorry. And the second condition is I can actually tell you what um, the inner product is. So, or I guess, sorry, not inner product. What my bilinear pairing is on the EIs and the EI primes. So, and furthermore, well, psi, little psi of EI or Sorry, uh, I would want to do the EI prime, EJ. Okay. Well, this is exactly um, this big isomorphism psi of EI prime. So this is now, I'm thinking of this thing as a linear functional. 
and v check of e sub j. Okay, so this is just by the definition of what this map big psi does. And well, since ei prime is psi inverse of fi, well then psi of ei prime has to be the fi, so this is fi of ej, okay. which is again zero if i is not equal to j, and one otherwise. Okay, so what, what conclusion can we draw from this? So this is going to end up being actually really useful in our proof. So um, conclusion for a non-degenerate degenerate by linear form psi. and basis EI, I can find what's called a dual basis. I can find a dual basis for V. Um, EI prime where psi of EI prime EJ is zero if I is not equal to J one else. Okay, and we're gonna basically the, the plan going forward is um, psi is going to be the trace by linear form. We're going to um, show this trace by linear form is non-degenerate by computing the discriminant um, using a little Galois theory in our formulas for trace. And then um, once we know the trace is non-degenerate, we can take a basis and get a dual basis. Um, and it turns out these this pair of bases is what's going to show that our um, uh, ring of integers are finally generating Z modules. Okay. That's the plan going forward. So that the next few lectures are going to be on computing discriminants and how do I tell if a bilinear form is non-degenerate more or less.